Well, good morning, good evening, good night. Welcome to another episode of First Light, and I am your weekly host, uh, Craig McKibben, because um, I guess no one else here in the house is really taking up the offer to, to do this. So, but yes, so you're stuck with me. So uh, it's great to have you here this morning, and as we continue on in our series, dealing with Romans. I can't believe it. We are uh, season four, episode 10. We're in the two digits, even in this season. And it's been crazy thinking of all of these episodes that we've been having over these uh, these weeks after weeks after weeks. And so I want to welcome you to say hi in the comment section. That lets us know that uh, you're there. We I, I even go back in weeks and say, hey, it's great to see you there. So this is uh, just an opportunity for you to check it. There we go. Look at that. Snoop Dogg is there. Good morning, Linda. Uh, good morning, Chris and uh, Denise. And so it is great having you with us as well as everybody else who's going to be watching later on. And uh, also we are going to be putting this on YouTube YouTube and stuff. Ellen, good morning and, and great having you here at um, 6.30 in the morning and it's almost like we got so excited that it started getting bright in the morning and then it's like, no, we're going to change the time and we're going to make you have to suffer a little longer before it gets light in the morning. So anyways, that's fine. Um, first light is more like a, um, a, a reasonable facsimile, I guess, or something like that, right? And for the next few weeks, anyways. But uh, I want to just uh, tell you how much I enjoy being a part of this. Do me a favor. It'd be great for you to invite people to join you, um, whether you watch this. I, I know that there's even a, at least one uh, of our, our groups, our smaller groups, we call it our fan, you know, the First Ave Network. And so one of our small groups, they, they meet on Thursday mornings and women and they 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 watch this. So I want to say a, a special shout out to you. Uh, good morning, Dina. And uh, say uh, I thank you that you um, are using this as part of your discipleship and, and for everybody who gets up in the morning and, and is a part of this. And I don't know, maybe it's in the background while you're getting ready for work or maybe it's, uh, I don't know how, how, how you have it set up, but still, I'm really glad that you're able to join us and be a part of this and feel free to invite others to be uh, a part of this as well. Also remember that we, it takes a bit of time, but um, we put this in a guide section. So like for those people who are wanting to, to kind of go through boop, 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 boop and not kind of have to scroll through all of the uh, app or like all of the data or all the things that are said that you can also click videos and it would come up there. Good morning, Richard. Great having you with us this morning as well. So there's different options. And so I, um, I think that uh, the, this is a kind of a, a, I was like looking at my OG mugs and I was like, oh, I probably did all these and I don't think I've done this. And I, 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 I do have a list. So uh, here is a uh, New York with the cool little taxi <laughs> for Starbucks. Here's a, my New York uh, thing. Ah, good morning, Chrissy. It's great having you here from, I assume, still in uh, Montreal there. And so it's great having you. So cheers to everybody this morning. And that is the first sip of the day, friends. That That is good stuff. I, I'm, I'm really glad to have that and, and be a part of that. So anyways, I'm just... That's the second sip of the day, folks. Okay, anyways, no. So uh, we've got lots to talk about today. Another controversy, so to speak, uh, um, in really how this kind of plays out. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> Thanks, Snoop Dogg. I appreciate that. Um, unless you're talking about like this, not this mug, not this mug. Uh, anyways, but yes. So, but uh, we got lots to talk about. So let's take a moment here briefly uh, and pray and then we'll jump right into Romans here. So God, I want to thank you that uh, you love each and every one of our mugs. Uh, that each one of our lives, you thank us or you, you, you love us and I want to thank you for that. And so God, I just pray you be with us during this time of, uh, of just reflection and help us to not just be readers of your word, but help us to be understanders of it and to really take it in and to become doers of it, not out of practice, Lord, but out of just the, the work that you're doing in us. And we ask this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right. Awesome. So we are jumping in here. Um, just to recap, you know, we're going through Romans. If you don't know that already, um, 
yeah, we're in Romans, and uh, and so I won't. If you don't, if you not watch the beginning parts, you may want to watch it just even the first one if you want to get a background. First uh, episode of season four um, when we're dealing with Romans here, because it really give you the understanding of the the uh, trials that were going on. Why Paul wrote this letter to a church he'd never gone to. So, anyways, we're here in uh, and continuing on but last year last week i just want to uh, um let you know that uh, just as a highlight to kind of bring us to where it is and i even brought it with me with that that grace expands greater to always handle whatever sin is so i used this illustration last week with this elastic that it just keeps getting bigger to, to whatever so you know sometimes i've had mail in there and they just kind of wrap it all up and so it's just it can it can cover it so anyways but that was last week and so i'm Hopefully, I believe we're going to be celebrating another chapter done today, but uh, we'll, we'll go on here. So we're at verse 12 of chapter 6, and remember I said we're jumping right into it, so I, I wasn't able to get things completed, but here we go. Verse 12, let's see how far we go. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires, and do not offer any parts of it to sin as weapons weapons for unrighteousness but as those who are alive from the dead offer yourselves to god and all the parts of yourselves to god as weapons for righteousness for sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law but under grace okay so we're gonna be so let me just I, you know what i think now that i think about this i just want to read that verse again because it's going to come up in a little bit here good morning liz great having you with us um so it says in verse 14 for sin will not rule over you because you are not under the law but under grace but anyways i want to circle back to that word weapons it says as weapons for unrighteousness or weapons for righteousness and i, I want to tell you it's a really interesting word that word when i when i saw weapons i was like what's that mean what does the word weapons mean and so um in my vast greek knowledge it's hope long okay hope long so it's not hope long meaning like uh, you know hoping for a long time that's not what it is but hope long but here's this catch this anything that its use is for war anything so it's basically weapon means anything you can muster that has its use in war or for war okay not necessarily in war only but for war so it could be any instrument it could be any tool it could be any article it doesn't matter the item this turns into a weapon when i choose to use it in warfare Okay, so that's basically what's saying. No, please, you know, I know, Doug, you like the mug, and so uh, I, I, I don't want to bust it here. But it's anything that gets used, and then of it gets used in war. And I think about that movie. Yes, I'm dating myself a little bit, but years ago, Beauty and the Beast. Um, if I had the time, I'd, I'd go on a rabbit trail, but I'm not going to do, do that. But Beauty and the Beast. Um, the cartoon movie, and I remember uh, Gaston, who is like the antagonist, Gaston, you know, he, he gets uh, everybody riled up, and he's like, go, go kill the beast, kill the beast, and you see people with like, you know, hoes, and, and pitchforks, and you know, like uh, sticks, and anything like that, and so it was, um, <laughs> you could mug someone, Jerry, what a way to say good morning, okay, there we have it, Jerry, <laughs> awesome but the the idea here is that you've got um uh the, anything that's being used for the purpose of using it in war and so those tools only they served one purpose but all of a sudden they turned into weapons and they were weaponized just because of their intent Okay, they're intent. Look at that. See, kill the bees there, Justin and uh, Alan. Look at that. You've you've got you've got fans there, Jerry. That's good. Okay, it's great. So Paul is saying that 
salvation, what salvation does is it reverses the process. It's saying that these were used as weapons in this war, but now we're using the war them as weapons for another war. Um, there's a war going on right now in Europe, and uh, and so there are uh, accounts where one um, nation, uh, when they are being driven out, they're not able to take everything with it. So actually the other nation is using those weapons now against those people. So this is what Paul is saying, is it takes something that was created for unrighteousness and then turns it in to be able to create it for righteousness. And those things just happen to be our bodies, our lives. We that were used for, or that we were uh, able to be uh, ruled by sin. And now because of grace, now we are able to be ruled and use our lives for good. Okay, let's keep going on. It says, verse this in verse 15, it says, what then should we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. Here's the Chuck Block line. Absolutely not. Heck no. Okay. So don't you know that if you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey. Oh man. I got to read that again. Don't you know that if you offer yourselves, you offer yourselves to someone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of that one you obey, either of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. Okay, so I want you to understand here, sin is always a choice. If you want to put that in the chat room, if you want to put that in your notes, that's fine. But sin is always a choice. You, how, you will always choose to either obey righteousness or unrighteousness. You're going to obey one of them, but you will always have a choice. So you can't say, well, I didn't have a choice, but sin. Mm, no, it's not in scripture. Anyways, let's go on. Verse 17. But, remember that, but thank God, but God, but thank God that although you used to be slaves to sin, slaves of sin, you obeyed from the heart that pattern of teaching to which you were handed over. Oh, man. <sighs> handed over. We're, we're not going to be dealing with it today. It's going to be probably next week. Handed over. Can we just underline that? I'm going to take my pen right now. I'm going to underline that because I don't even have this in my notes as I've been working ahead. So... Okay, this is going to be a big, that's a big phrase, okay? Uh, teaching to which you were handed over, okay? We've been conditioned to sin. Our lives by making uh, these poor choices because we were ruled by sin until we're saved by grace, that we're conditioned to sin. So we've been taught basically to fend for ourselves. Um, you see it in society today that it's like, People are wanting to say, no, 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 you have to listen to me. I don't need to listen to you, but you need to listen to me. But everybody in the room is saying the same thing. So, yeah, okay, we'll move on from that. So it really becomes the survival of the fittest. It becomes this idea of just who's going to dominate this thing. And so that's where we find that this is where sin rules over us. But we're handed over. Oh, my goodness, that's such a big phrase. Okay, verse 18 says, and having been set free from sin. I'm going to circle that part. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I'm getting blessed myself. Okay, you, you don't even know why yet. Okay, and so having been set free from sin, you became enslaved now to righteousness. Okay, you're still obeying, but now it's righteousness. Okay, I am using a human analogy because of the weakness of your flesh. That's what Paul's saying. Okay, for just as you offered the parts of yourselves as slaves to impurity... And to greater and greater lawlessness, remember, I've said this before, sin is insatiable. It will always try to, it will never be quenched in a thirst. It will always try to get down to a degraded version of itself, right? So it says to greater and greater lawlessness. So now offer them as slaves to righteousness, which results in sanctification. So here's what you need to understand. We will always be slaves to something. 
We will be, you say, ah, oh, I rule my own life. Well, then you're a slave to sin. Okay, so you just think that, right? You think of people like that say, well, I'm free. Well, I'm not really free in Canada. I'm a Canadian citizen and there's laws in Canada and I can't just say I'm free to do anything I want. Well, no, then the police are going to pick you up. Okay, depending on what you do anyways. Um, and what you do with this mug, um, which I'm going to get the third drink. That's good. Okay, so we're all slaves to some ruler, uh, the ruler of unrighteous living or the ruler of righteous living. So we choose and one choice leads to death and one choice leads not to eternal life, but one choice leads to eternal living, eternal living. I just, I want to drive that in that we get life now, right now. Okay, verse 20. Okay, here we're going to get a, a familiar verse maybe. Okay, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free with regard to righteousness. So what fruit was produced then from the things you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now, since you've been set free from sin and have become enslaved to God, you have your fruit, which results in sanctification. And the outcome is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Very familiar verse. So I'm not going to bring in a lot in this. Does a bathroom break come with that mug? Um, I, 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 if, if you want to take a bathroom break, I, I, I can't just walk away from it. But anyways, but um, you, you, let me just say, you, you've probably heard the verse, but it's very poetic. The wages of sin is death, but the gift wages of God, sin, is eternal life, death. So it's actually showing, what. remember we're talking, you're slaves to one thing or the other. So if you're a slave to sin, this is what happens. You're gonna get paid, but you're gonna get paid death because of sin. But if you are a slave to righteousness, you are afforded something Okay, wow. This I see what you're saying. Yes. It is a it is a fair size muck. Um but the 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 gift of God is eternal life. That that is something that is not it's afforded to us, not the work that we've done, so it's not a wage. It is the gift because somebody else has paid it. I think we've been talking about that. Big celebration mark. We are in chapter seven now, friends. <laughs> There we are. Awesome. Okay, let's keep going. I don't know. We may we may get further than I thought. Okay, let's go. Verse 7. I'm going to read a few verses here. So, since I am speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know? So, he's saying this. I'm speaking to those who know the law. Who knows the law? The Christian Jews that are there, okay? Since I am speaking to those who know the law, brothers and sisters, don't you know that the law rules over someone as long as he lives? For example, for example, for example, a married woman is legally bound to her husband while he lives. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law regarding the husband. So then, if she is married to another man while her husband is living, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from that law. Then if she is married to another man, she's not an adulteress. Okay? So basically, if you take the mug and crack him over the head, eh, there you are. You're okay in your marriage. Don't quote me on that. Okay, verse four. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you also were put to death in relation to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. You were also put to death in relation to the law so that you could belong to another. You belong to him who was raised from the dead in order that we may bear fruit for God. Okay, so here, 
God, Paul's making this really, really good case uh, for the Roman church to understand. But really, I believe that 2,000 years later, um, we have, it's, it's so meaningful to us because in, in essence, what Paul is getting at, and we see that Jesus refers to it in this, is that he's using marriage, which God established as a symbol of his relationship with us. Marriage, um, marriage, okay, for those Princess Bride friends, um, the marriage is a symbol. Okay, that's why like when people will ask me, um, do you do non-religious weddings? I'll always say to them, uh, well, you may think they are. <laughs> like, <laughs> to, to me, marriage is is a religious experience because it is this this uh, pattern of God speaking to humanity about the relationship that he has slash wants, depending on where you are um, in your relationship with him, with you, okay? So in Ephesians 5, okay, he even says that this is a profound mystery, it's a profound ministry how God views us, okay? God views us by relationship, not ritual. I'm going to say that again. God views us by relationship, not ritual. And the law was becoming ritualistic. The law was about abiding by the law. And as long as you are abiding by the law, then you and God are good. But the moment that you break the law, now you and God are not good. Okay, fine. Great. I'm going to take this mug, crack it over a goat, and then I will be able to be good with God again. That's what the law says, but it is not about the ritual. It's about the relationship. It's always <laughs> inconceivable. Um, this, this relationship with God, God having it with us, that's what matters here. And so marriage is a covenant between two people. It's a covenant, a decision. It's a con. It's a contract in of sorts, in the sense of it. it's like this is what I will do. This is what I will do. It's this mutual agreement between two people. And so what he's saying is, if the person is alive, okay, then the wife is married to him. Once the husband dies, she's free to marry again. Okay, and. Believe me, when I said this is controversial, I'm not getting into this thing about divorce and remarriage. We're not going to touch that right now because this is not the point that I'm getting at. We're going to have that discussion on another on another day. But I'm just getting to you. Like when I'm, when I'm setting this thing up, I'm not talking about people who are divorced and married. No, no, no. That's not what I'm getting at. What Paul is getting at is he's trying to talk to the people about the relationship that God has with us. And so once the, the husband dies, she's free to marry again. Because she can't be, catch this, this is what's important. She can't be in two marriages, okay, because the first one has ended. She's not in two marriages. She is only in one marriage because the first marriage no longer mattered because that person died. So he's saying that the relationship with Christ this new covenant that Christ has made with us, okay, this new covenant is based on the first covenant of the law now being dead. So there's the old covenant and then there's the new covenant. So this first covenant is now dead. It's not, and this is what makes it controversial, it's not still meaningful but it's dead because God created a second marriage, a second covenant, but he couldn't do it until the first one died. How did the first one have to die? Someone had to come up to the standard of the law and be that sacrifice because he paid, he basically was given the sentence of somebody who deserved death because of sin, but he was innocent. He was innocent of it, meaning Jesus, therefore it nulled the law because the law got 
not severed because it it basically broke and if you want to look at it that way because now someone jesus lived a life and died according to the law but should not have died because he was perfect he was perfect that's how he became our sacrifice and to be able to do this but christ's covenant is the proof of the end of the first covenant but this is where i want to stress this is so important i said to you it's still meaningful so there are people that say well this says that the law doesn't matter anymore and because of grace we can just do anything we want because we now live in grace and grace will always be greater than sin okay that's this universalistic idea but it even translates into this idea of just like well you know what we don't really need the law or anything like that it's still meaningful because that was god's first marriage his standards of what his bride should be hasn't changed it hasn't changed at all this he has said basically in his like profile online to date god he says this is what I'm looking for in my wife. 619 things is what I want to see in my wife. And that's called the law. And so we have that. And now there is one who fulfilled that and made it void. It, it severed, broke that relationship. Or, you know, the law died, really. I, I can say that because Paul says it first. So I don't feel bad about it. The law died. But it was still his first wife and it was she was perfect and so now christ has made the church perfect out of his covering over it but for the christian it's still the law still shows us what god wanted the the relationship what mattered these are the things that are going to bring joy in our relationship the decision to follow christ and to make righteous decisions not faulty decisions of going against what god says okay let's keep going here maybe i don't know i, I was thinking we may go a little further eh, we'll see we'll see how far we go okay it says verse five says this for when we were in the flesh the sinful passions aroused through the law were working in us to bear the fruit of death. But now we have been released from the law since we have died to what held us so that we may serve in the newness of the spirit and not in the old letter of the law. So verse seven says, what should we say then? Is the law sin? Heck no. Absolutely not. But I would not have known sin if it were not for the law. For example, I would not have known what it was to covet if the law had not said, do not covet. I love when Paul says, Craig, I agree with you. Craig, let me back you up with what you just said. Okay. Yeah, this is exactly what he's saying. Now I know what God's looking for in, in his wife. Okay, so do not covet. Good, I'm not going to covet. So it is not there. It doesn't, it, is the law sin? No, but it reveals it. It reveals it. You know, this is an example here. Um, the very first time that we see the phrase forgery in writing is around the 1300s and forgery okay and so basically what it forgery means and in that way and is brought here is something made in another likeness but it's not the same so it's something that has been like um i was gonna say forged but that's not right whatever i you know what it's too early in the morning but if if something is a is a forgery it is looks like it but it's not the same thing okay but what is important is you can only know what a forgery is only if you know what the original is. So how do you pick out a fake thing is you have to know what the real thing is. And so what happens is the, the law exposes the counterfeit. Thank you. The, it, look at that. Welcome. Hey, Mike. This is awesome. Let's go. I love having you here, Mike. And so the law exposes the covenant that's what it does 
Okay, let's, you know what, just for fun, I'm going to go a little bit further here. I'm going to go further than I thought we'd be going here today, just, but I'm going to have to cram through this because I only have three minutes here, but I want to be able to do it. Verse 8 says this, and sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. For apart from the law, sin is dead. Once I was alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, spring or sin sprang to life and I died. The commandment, he catches this is important. The commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. Okay. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but this is really important to catch. The commandment that was meant for life, because remember, this is the law. Do this and you have life. But the commandment that was meant for life resulted in death for me. And it helps us understand the significance of sin. The law was set up to keep you in good standing. That's what the law did. The law was there to keep you in good standing bing, until you didn't keep the law. That's all the law did. The law kept you in good standing until you didn't uphold it. Then you are by default in bad standing, in good standing, and then you are in bad standing, okay? Here, basically this, this is maybe a quote you wanna know, by default, you are now in default, okay? You are on in default. It has nothing to do with the relationship, it has nothing to do with whether you're a nice person, whether I like you, or whatever, no, no, no. you're in default, right? You pay your bill, they said it has to be paid by April 1st. Okay, if April 2nd comes and you have not paid your bill by the due date, it is in arrears. You are gonna have a penalty. It has nothing to do, you, they don't feel bad or anything like that, it's just the agreement. You, you want this, then you have to pay this by a certain date. And if you don't pay it, then there's a penalty charged to it. There's no emotion charged to it, there's no emotional attachment, it's just, this is how it happens. And that's why the law, the first marriage died because it was like not what God wanted, but he needed to set up the first marriage so that we knew now in grace what, we, what would be expected of us to bring him joy in how we live our lives and that. Well, anyways, I moved a little bit further, moved the ball a little bit further down the field than I expected. But anyways, I'm excited to be with you. And uh, I just want you to know today that we're in this second marriage. But uh, in these conversations with God, he's been very clear to us as to what that first marriage was like and what really uh, was things that he loved about it. And so why do we want to honor him and get, make the use our bodies, use our lives, and use them as tools, as weapons now for righteousness because it will bring God joy when we live our lives in obedience and when we live our lives in, in righteousness. Anyways, anyways, seven bells. Glad you joined me today. And uh, next week, I have a surprise for you. <laughs> Okay, it's going to be a surprise for you, but you have to wait till next week to find out about it. All right, until then, go in peace. God bless you guys.